my ducks, my swans, welcome to the pond. My ducks, my swans, welcome to the pond. Welcome back to the podcast. 82 points of view. This is episode 16. Still flying solo. Shout out to John Ricker and Kyle Shirt at Adobe House. Do a lot of good stuff over there, man. But um, I've released two episodes so far with me doing solo, and I really enjoy it. Y'all been consuming it. But I want to come in and just talk to y'all tonight about friendship. And a lot of y'all, man, are so caught up on friendship and how friendship should be, what friendship's about about the people who are your friends, how they act, if you should be treating them the same way that they treat you. And the thing about friendship, man, is that it's probably the most complicated relationship that you'll ever have. And the reason it's the most complicated relationship that you'll ever have is because your friends meet you at a young age when you are a person who is trying to find some sort of separation from your parents, right? And so, since they meet you at like 8, 9, 10, 11, you're doing shit you're not supposed to be doing, right? Your friends know you as you cuss. Your friends know what kind of music you into. Your friends know how vulgar you are. Your friends know you the best at, from ages 8 to about 21. Like, they know you the absolute best, better than anybody. And... From 8 to 21, I mean, you think about it, you go through so many changes. I mean, from puberty to uh, making teams, getting cut from teams, to height issues, weight issues, acne, from seeing if you have something going on in your family, whether it's like a divorce or deaths, pets dying, graduating from schools, getting jobs girlfriends, boyfriends, all that stuff, like they are with you every step of the way because they're the people you can be 100% yourself with. But with that said, man, it gets to a point with your friends where like you realize that y'all are growing apart and neither one of the two people who are growing apart really want to be the reason that growing apart happens. And so because of that, you try to force stuff that's not there. And you start being in a position where you're like, do these people really care about me? They truly love me. Am I tripping? Do I need to be putting as much value to this relationship as I have before? And what usually causes that is maturity and then romantic partners. Because when you start becoming really intimate with somebody, I'm going to use college as an example. I know everybody listening didn't go to college, but I feel like it's the best example because that's the first time that, like, you're in a relationship with somebody and they spend the night over your house all the time. And y'all eating every meal together. And y'all are constantly having sex. It's just a very intense and intimate relationship that you have never dealt with before. And in turn, that romantic partner knows you better than your friends ever will. And so that's where the pillow talking comes in, right? As I adjust my microphone. That's, that's where the pillow talking comes in, right? That's where um, everybody who gets upset because you start telling your friends business because the relationship between you and your friends has weakened. And also at the same time, you need somebody to vent to who actually knows you, right? You can't vent to your parents about why you and your friends ain't talking. Like you can't really vent to them about that because you can't tell your friend, your parents that like, well, me and such and such ain't talking because she keeps sucking random dick on the weekend. I'm not into that shit. You know what I mean? Like, you don't want your parents to even look at your friend like that. A, or B, start wondering like, damn, well, have you ever been in a situation where you suck a random dick? You know what I mean? So, it becomes the only people you can talk to is your romantic partner. And what, that, and what happens with that is you start having a very deep connection. And so, because of that, you and your friends go further apart and further apart, and further apart, and eventually, every friendship goes through this. It's like some sort of blow up, or some sort of like breakup, essentially, from your friend, and you start looking at like, damn, I've never felt this before. Like, breaking up with a romantic partner is not like breaking up with a friend. Like, when you break up with your romantic partner, you are losing a friend, but when you break up with your friend, it's like losing a family member. And it's a very complicated relationship because if y'all known each other since y'all was eight years old, y'all families are tied together. Like 
other friends know that y'all are friends. So when people see you, hey, man, what's up with such and such? Like, y'all don't even talk to them no more. Damn, like, what happened? whoop de whoop And it's just like, man, I don't even want to talk about that shit. So it becomes a very difficult thing. And then what I've noticed is like, so from ages 21 to probably 26, like, there's this really great area of the friendship. But then what happens is romantic partners go from girlfriend, boyfriend, to fiance, to husband, to wife, to y'all have kids together. Now you have started your own family. And because you started your own family, the family that you came from, the dynamics of that family has changed now, right? Like your mom doesn't talk to you like she used to. Your dad doesn't talk to you like he used to. Your sisters and brothers kind of look at you different than they used to. So now you got to deal with that, the change of that relationship. And you then you also have to deal with the fact of that now you have kids. And since you have kids, right, there's a relationship like now, now your mommy, now your daddy. And it's something that becomes a lot to get used to. Like nobody prepares you for that in adulthood. Like nobody. And since nobody prepares you for that, you start thinking, you're like, man, shit. How am I going to adjust and I would love to go back to my old self for a brief moment. And who are the people that you can go back to your old self to? Your friends, right? And then that's where a reconnection occurs. And it's a more mature reconnection because you know that you will never ever be as close to your friends as you were when you were 13, 14, 15, 16. But from ages 26 on, I'm 35 now, I know that my friends know me in a way that nobody else knows me, and I value them for that. I don't have to talk on the phone with them every day. I don't have to see them all the time, but I know that those are my brothers. And when you get to that point in your friendships, that is the most beautiful thing you can have in adulthood. It's because you know no matter what, you have family that's not blood, and you need that. I know I need that. I know I absolutely need that because I don't have blood brothers, right? But God blessed me with a lot of friends that I consider brothers. And so even though I don't talk to like Corey and Darrell and Carl and um, Darian and Marshall and, and Sean and um, I don't want to leave C. Rice. I talk to him a lot. But like I don't want to leave nobody out. Darren, Dev, Rally. You know what I mean? Even like even though I don't talk, I don't see them a lot, right? I know that these are people that I'm really close to Tim, if something happens that I know that they'll be there for me. And so with David, Adam, like I talk to y'all a lot, but like you, it's great to have those friendships and people that you can lean on. And another thing you got to learn about friendships too, is that you have to realize that you might give more to the friendship, my homeboy, Steve Mormon. I'm probably just going to be naming people the rest of the podcast now. Like, you have to realize that you will probably give more to the friendship than the friendship's going to give to you. Like, I know that. Like, all, out of all those people that I named, there are some people that I know I give more to than they give to me, and there are some people that I know that they give to me more than I give to them. And homeboy Tommy. So so because of that, I'm probably going to laugh now every time I say somebody's name. <laughs> but like, um, like I, I know now that that's, that's okay. That's okay, man. Like, it's okay that I give more than they give me. It's okay that some people give more than I give them. Cause I, I can't, I don't have time to balance those relationships. Like I once did. Right. Like when I have to make sure that in my romantic relationship with my woman, that there's balance, right. I got to make sure that I'm giving her what she's giving me. And vice versa, right? I need to make sure that it's there. Um, I have a daughter. And that is like having a child is the most one-sided relationship you'll ever be in in your life. Like Nova is just all take. Like daddy, 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 daddy. daddy. You, she's not saying it yet, but her energy does. And so since Nova's all take, I know that I'm investing a lot in her. And what she gives me is just like a smile or sleeping on my chest or a laugh. And that... Is something that I can't get anywhere else. And even with my parents. And I think that's been like a source of contention. I even talk about it with my sister too. Like I wish me and my sister were closer, but we had different moms growing up. And because we had different moms growing up, um, 
we only lived in the same under the same roof for one year. And I think had we lived under the same roof for at least like three or four years, we'd have a much closer relationship. But I know she would do anything for me and I would do anything for her and for my nephews, Jalen and Adrian, for my niece, Malia, like and even my great niece. How crazy is that? Paisley, like that's that's my family. That's that's my blood. I would do anything for them. And so I even look at them as like my legacy. I hope Group 82 grows where Jam, that's what Tamika calls them, and then P, so I guess Jam P. Um, I hope that one day that like they're on the executive board of Group 82. And I hope that they are the ones that keep this going along with Nova. Like that's that would be a beautiful thing for me. But going back to what I was saying, that scratch noise, that was me scratching my beard. Um, but like, I think that's a source of contention with me and my parents too, is because as I got older, they kept viewing me as the little boy, even though I was maturing and the dynamics of the relationship was, was were changing. And I don't think they really wanted to completely embrace that. And my mom finally did, but my dad still hasn't. And so that's why me and him, we aren't talking right now. Like I haven't talked to my dad since September, October, and um, I'm okay with it. Like this isn't the first time he and I haven't talked like it's happened before, but this is the first time where it's happened and it's not bothering me. And it almost bothers me a little bit that it doesn't bother me, but at the same time, I know that there are specific things that he needs to work on that if he doesn't make the conscious decision to work on them, he and I will never have a relationship that's going to be worthwhile because I just can't deal with it anymore because now I have Nova, I have my daughter, and she deserves me in my best state. So that's the only person I really care about. I don't have time to deal with adults and their problems. And so you have to really, learning to balance all those relationships is one of the most underrated things in adulthood that no one talks about. And no one trains you on that. It's like entrepreneurship. Like no one teaches you how to be an entrepreneur. No one teaches you how to be a adult son, an adult daughter, an adult brother, an adult friend, an adult uncle, an adult cousin. No one teaches you that. Like even going to my cousins, right? Like Jamika and Kanja and I still can't believe she's not here anymore. Jerusha, rest in peace, and Brittany and Sherelle and <clears throat> Robert and Nosa and little Reggie and Danielle and Dana. Like those are all my first cousins that I just named. And it's just crazy that even our relationships, our dynamic has changed over the years. Um, and I know like I'm at fault with some of that, but at the same time too, it's, I can only give, I know I can only give so much, right? And at the, at the same time, things have to be reciprocated. Like people want me to come home to them. Dayton is home, but Indianapolis is, is my home. Even though I lived in Dayton for a little bit, it's like, I have no reason to come to Dayton but to see y'all. But I've lived a lot of places. Like, how many times have y'all came to see me, right? And so it kind of turns into that because once you give so much of yourself, and I know in my 20s I gave a lot. Once you give so much of yourself, you eventually get to the point, man, where you're like, this has to be equal. Like, the laws of reciprocity apply in family relationships, too. The laws of reciprocity apply in friendships, too. And I don't think people realize that. I think humans are innately selfish. And I think humans, specifically Americans, are innately insecure. I was having this conversation tonight on Periscope at Dorian Group 82 on Periscope. I've been going on there a lot more. Um, and I said this on Periscope that every problem we have in America is rooted in insecurity and selfishness. Think about it. Racism. People are insecure that another race is going to take from them. And they're selfish because they don't want to share the resources that they have based on how someone else looks. Sexism. Men are insecure that women are going to have as much power as them. Classism. Income inequality. The medical issues we have with health care. Any school shootings, 
definitely rooted in some sort of insecurity that got preyed upon in some capacity, whether it got preyed on preyed upon at home with the parents being abusive, the siblings being abusive or them being abused, uh, being abused at school and the selfishness where they're like, you know what? I'm going to take out how I feel on everyone else. I'm going to kill people. Every problem we have is rooted in insecurity and selfishness. And so those are the two things that I'm the most conscious of when it comes to my growth and this entire process of me maturing into the ultimate form of Alton Dorian Clark. I'm very conscious of the fact that I have to be selfless as much as I can and to not prey on my own insecurity, right? Like, own security is like right now, I'm insecure a little bit about my weight. And the reason being is because like, have a baby, you sit around and you eat and I'm working out, but nigga, you ate bad for like seven months. I don't look terrible, but I could look better, right? But right now I'm on a cleanse. I'm on a fast. Not fast the ninety day the first ninety days of every year. And I've been doing that. And so I feel great. And the pounds are coming off and I'm getting in better shape. And y'all gonna see in like six months I'm gonna look like a different nigga almost. But like but I don't let that insecurity stop me from going on camera. I don't let that insecurity stop me from shooting from different angles right as you can see right now for those y'all that are coming in and looking at this on youtube i got the camera straight on and i got the camera angle right here that i filming on my ipad like like i was looking i'm looking like okay when i sit down can you see my titties is it really my titties is it my chest is it like because the shit's hard but it might not look hard in that angle you know what i mean like i'm thinking about all that because you have those insecurities it's how it is like everybody is insecure about something but I don't let that inhibit me from doing the things that I really want to do. If you had to beat my chest, let you niggas know, nigga. I'm bitching 405 in this bitch. Talk shit if you want to. But you have to be conscious of that. And a lot of people do not want to face their own insecurities. And because they don't want to face those own, their own insecurities, they leave those wounds open. And because they leave those wounds open, they take it out on other people and usually they take it out on the people that they love the most, which is extremely selfish. And that leads to the destruction of relationships. That leads to the, the destruction of families. You have to stay in control of your insecurities. You have to stay in control of the things that you're being selfish about. And being in control of the things you're selfish about doesn't mean that you got to be 100% selfless. Doesn't mean you got to be a pushover. Doesn't mean you got to be naive. Doesn't mean you got to let people take advantage of you. And that doesn't, that's not what that means, right? I've met a lot of people, a lot of women in my life that thought that's what that meant. No, that's not what that means. There are times we need to be selfish. Like um, around that time that me and my dad stopped talking because I, I literally like went off on him like, I have went off on very few people in my life. I mean, extremely loud yelling and cussing and telling him about himself. And I was just completely just at my wit's end. And I needed that. I needed to be selfish in that moment. Everybody needs moments where they need to be selfish. When we were coaching, shout out to Kevin Sutton, my, uh, the coach I worked under at Montverde. His Instagram is Living Trophies. Go follow him on Instagram, Living Trophies, Coach Sutton. And one thing we always tell our players when I was coaching in Mount Vernon was because basketball is a very, very team-oriented sport, so you need to be selfless. But when you're at the free throw line, you need to be the most selfish motherfucker of all time. You're at the free throw line. It's just you. Your, your teammates can't help you. You need to think about padding your stats. You need to hit both of these free throws because you hitting both of those free throws helps the team. And that's a microcosm for life. There are times where you need to be hitting both free throws. There are times we need to be selfish. And sometimes it might be not answering the phone. Sometimes it might not, it might be not going to that birthday party. For me, um, when my cousin Jerusha died, who I alluded to earlier, she died of cancer. If you listen to the podcast, you know, I talked about her before a previous episode. She died of breast cancer last year. She was 30 years old, which is, it's like I said, I still can't believe she's not here. But I had to be selfish. I wasn't in the mental state to go to her funeral. Like, I wasn't in the right state to see her in that casket bald. I needed to be selfish. That that would have 
at the where I was at that point in my life, I don't and all the things I had going on, all the moving pieces from the business to Nova just being born to us about to move to Houston and all that. I don't know if I would if I would have went and saw that and been around that energy, how I would have been when I came back. And if I would have been the best version of me as my family, my immediate family needed me to be. And so I didn't I didn't go. I didn't I didn't go to her funeral. And um I don't know how my aunt feels about Auntie Janice. I love her. I don't know how my cousin Janika Nosa feel about it. I told them I wasn't coming. I don't know how my other family members feel about it. But you know what? That's what I needed in that moment. Because when I went to Uncle Rex's funeral, who, all this on my dad's side, when my uncle passed away, when I went to Uncle Rex's funeral, um, when I got back, I, I, it just didn't, it didn't give me closure, right? Funerals don't really give me closure. So when I went to Uncle Rex's funeral, man, I, I, I just, I was there for my family. And we had some happy moments there, and we laughed and stuff, and too. But it, it just, I still kept thinking about him. I still kept thinking about everything. And I know, like, funerals don't really heal, but I knew how I felt. And because I knew how I felt then, even when I was in a better mental space, and I had less responsibilities when Uncle Rick passed away, with Jerusha, it was like, yo, I can't go to this. I'm not, I can't, if I'm going to feel like, how I felt at Uncle Rex's funeral after Jerusha's funeral, I'm not going to be able to function well when I get back. And my family needs me right now. And they need me to perform at an extremely high level. I need to be selfish, right? And if my family doesn't understand that, that sucks. Oh, well. I don't know what you want me to do about it. But I think that they do. Because um, they know there's never any malintent in my heart. I'm never a malicious person. I never do things out of like robbing other people of their resources or their emotions. I do. I actually do the opposite. I actually think about what can I do to put myself in the best position to make sure that people don't feel like I'm robbing them of their resources and their emotions. And the number one resource I think about is uh, time, but especially emotions like like every woman who I've dated, I've given them a blueprint of the things that I enjoy and things that I don't. Things that turn me on, things that turn me off. Things that will make me a very good mate and a great communicator and the things that will make me irritated and angry. And if you stay on the side of everything that's good, I'm not going to be this fake robot. I'm going to be a genuinely happy, good person. But when you do those other things, like especially since I've told you these are the things that irritate me, now you're robbing me of my emotions. And what, why are you robbing me of my emotions? Because at times, like I said, you need to be selfish. You need to do that too. Like at times you need to rob people of their emotions, right? Like <laughs> the other day when I went to uh, Lifetime Fitness, I posted about this on my Instagram. And long story short, I go late at night, Lifetime Fitness, you got to ring a doorbell to get in. I rang the doorbell three times. They got mad. And the reason I rang it three times, because I've been out there before, I had to ring it 10 times. They got mad, told me I ring it too much. I went off, hooty whoop. Didn't go off, off. We went off enough. Like, yo, I pay my dues. I ring the doorbell as much as I fucking want to. Y'all want me to ring the doorbell, have your ass up front. Went to the locker room, uh, sent the email, complaining, went to the sauna. And when I went to the sauna, one of the employees came in there, a little smaller white girl. It's just me and her in the sauna at 3 a.m. And she was trying to apologize and she was trying to say how she felt. And I told her, I said, listen, I'm not comfortable right now. I'm very uncomfortable with this. Can I'm just going to handle it through the protocol of the emails, right? I don't want you in here with me. And she was like, okay, let me scoot over. I'm going to stand right here. And I said, I'm not comfortable with you being in here. I don't want to talk. Please leave me alone. Literally, my words. Might not sound like that I said that, but that's exactly what I said. She went and stood right in front of the door and proceeded to pour her heart out. So if I wanted to leave, I would have to have went through her. Like, one of the most uncomfortable situations I've been in in some time. And at that time, she robbed me of my emotions, right? She, she was being extremely selfish. And so... Once I filed my complaint with uh, Lifetime, I had to file two because that was after the initial email. 
I got a meeting with them coming up. When I get in that meeting, do you think I give a shit about their emotions? Do you think I'm going to be in that meeting caring about if I'm robbing them of their resources and emotions? No, I don't give a fuck about you. You got to give a fuck about me. And tomorrow when that meeting is, that's the energy that it deserves, right? And there, and you get in these moments in your life where that's how it is. There's times where you got to be selfish. There's times where you got to rob people of their emotions. Sometimes people don't respect you until you disrespect them. And it's, it's extremely fucked up that it's like that, man. It's, it's really fucked up. It's really fucked up that a lot of humans don't respect you until you respect them. But it's how it is. It's how it fucking is. And so what are you going to do? You just want to sit there and be a pushover? You go sit there and let people make you feel bad? Because like I said about those wounds earlier when I was talking about that, like those insecurities and those wounds, you can't just leave that shit open. You, you can't just leave it open. Like you have to deal with that. And a lot of people don't want to deal with it. And because they don't want to deal with it, their family ends up being the ones who suffer. So I'm not about to let the doorbell nigga or chick at Lifetime Fitness put me in such a bad mood that I come home and now Nova has to deal with it. Or now Rihanna has to deal with it. That ain't fair to them. They ain't do that. They ain't do nothing. Now, I'm going to give that energy back to where it came from. It came from Lifetime Fitness. You about to get this energy back. And I think a lot of people have hard times with that. They have a hard time compartmentalizing emotions and a hard time compartmentalizing where the negative energy came from and giving that negative energy back. I know for our parents' generation, they were terrible at this, not all, but a lot, of taking out the things that were happening to them at work on us. If you mad at somebody at work, you need to take that shit out of them motherfuckers at work. Don't bring that shit home. Don't bring that shit home. But they grew up in a different era, especially black parents like or minority parents. This might be the only opportunity you get to feed your kids. You might not get any other opportunities. So it's some stuff at work that you just got to deal with. Our generation is not like that. A, because we're more educated, but B, because of what I'm using right now, the internet, right? It's the ultimate equalizer. Like, I don't have to deal with bullshit. Every job I had before I became a full-time entrepreneur, I wasn't dealing with their bullshit. I'm not about, you're not about to have me out here feeling like that I'm being disrespected. I'm not about to do a bunch of stuff I don't want to do. Fuck off. It's not happening. You're not about to give me no negative energy. You give me a negative energy, I'm giving that shit right back to you. And I know when you work for people or you work with people, there are times you need to take it on the chin. That's a pause moment. Sorry, John. Pause. And John Ricker, for those who don't know, listen to the podcast. Like he's, he's anti-pause. Um, but there's times you got to take it on the, on the chin. But at the same time, man, it's like there's a difference between being a disciplined and obedient employee for the betterment of the team and being a pushover dealing with disrespect. Once again, like I said, people thrive on their insecurities and their selfishness. It happens in, at work all the time, all the time. And so as a person who deals with that consistently, you have to make sure that you have that you protect yourself, you protect your own emotions because the people who you love the most are going to be the recipients. And that's what leads to negative relationships and family. And that's what leads to ultimately families being destroyed and it leads to suicide. Right? Like I haven't been like suicidal to the point where um, I put the knife to my wrist or anything like that. Like I had suicidal thoughts when I was like 11 I think it was just a lot of me just moving around a lot and not feeling like I fit in and not really having anybody to talk to and not knowing my identity. But it wasn't like anything crazy. But I have, uh, like I said, I have thought about what it would be like if I wasn't here. And I had to go to the root of it. Like, why am I thinking like that? Right? Because I'm a person of a lot of empathy. I'm a person who understands other people's points of view really well. 82 points of view with Dorian. And... So when I started putting myself, when you're an adolescent and you have that gift, we're able to put yourself in other people's shoes. You start feeling a lot of these emotions. It's almost like Jean Grey off of X-Men, right? She 
is outstanding and put herself in other people's shoes. She can hear everybody's thoughts. And I ain't saying I'm, I was like that, but I definitely felt a lot of shit, a whole lot of shit. And um, it's a lot to deal with. And so I was thinking that it was more so me, but then I, as I got older, I realized it wasn't me. It was outside sources. And then I just learned like how to deal with it. But everybody's like me. Everybody doesn't get that opportunity to really process those emotions and they don't have like the reference points throughout their life. They didn't live in a bunch of different cities and their parents didn't go from lower class to middle class. They didn't grow up as a military brat, right? So they didn't have all the resources that I had, the emotional and sociological resources that I had in order to learn like, yo, this stuff isn't all you, man. You've, you've dealt with a lot of different energies at such a young age. And once we went, moved to Indiana, and I was there from sixth grade all the way through the end of college, it was an equilibrium because I was dealing with the same people and the same energies from that from all those years. And so I was able to catch up and really learn about myself. And now I'm able to compartmentalize things much better than the average human. And it's, it's a really good gift to have. And I wish that everybody could do that. I think um, especially people that are prone to depression. I I'm not prone to depression, but like I said, I have my insecurities too. And since I have empathy, they sometimes take more of a toll on me than they should. But I know how to bounce back. Like, I know what I need to do. And that's why I get selfish in those moments, like not going to Jerusha's funeral and things like that. So I'm going to stop right there. Give you all an ad. This ad is for ads. So what I mean by that is if you want to advertise in our podcast, Hit me up on Instagram at Dorian Group 82. Hit me up on there. Go to our website, group82music.com. Hit us up on the contact page. And our podcast is reaching a decent amount of people right now. We're going to start pumping out a whole bunch of episodes. So if you're listening to the podcast, you got a business, you want to advertise on here, let us know. And I'll just tell y'all right now, the price is as cheap as it's going to be. So if you want one of these ads, one of these spots, like right here, you want to fill this up with time. That's your business. It's a hundred dollars. I don't care what the business is. Just go send me a DM. Let me know what you want us to talk about. Give us a rundown of your business. hundred dollars. Boom. Got a free ad advertisement. So any business out there want it? hundred dollars. Hop on it. Cause the shit is not going to stay at this price. Swear to God, not the pod. Y'all stay true. We're back from that advertisement. Dead ass. Higher dollars. Cheap as going to be. So on the second part of this, podcast man i want to kind of continue on the theme of friendship and family i want to talk about it from a business perspective i know a lot of people man who want to start businesses and they don't want to do it by themselves which i kind of get but not really um i feel like any entrepreneur who's a for real entrepreneur you need to be comfortable working alone and working by yourself and doing shit on your own but i understand everybody's not built like me so who am i to judge and because of that, they want to go into business with their family or their friends. And I was having this conversation today in the barbershop. And I was talking about, shout out to J-Rock and out there in Houston who cut my hair. But like, I was having this conversation and we were speaking about how when you go into business with strangers, they only have that business relationship with you. So they only view you as a person who is providing business value, right? So they treat it like a business. They respect you like a business owner. They respect you like the entrepreneur that you are, which is the what you need to run a successful business. When you go into business with your friends or with your family, they don't view you as an entrepreneur. They don't view you as a business owner. They don't view you like they view their boss. They view you as the nigga who used to eat, eat his boogers. I never ate my boogers, by the way. I just never understood that, but that's the example I use. Or they view you as the person who shit on themselves in the fifth grade, right? Like, they don't take you as serious as strangers will. And because of that, I know, speaking for me personally, I am a much different person when I'm leading Group 82 than when I'm leading my family, Right? There are times in Group 82 that I'm just a bona fide asshole because I got to be because I don't like being bullshitted. And I tell everybody who works for us and with us, bro, you ain't got to bullshit me. Like I didn't hurt. I didn't have every job and 
I didn't had 100% commission jobs. I didn't had unpaid internships. I didn't had salary jobs, remote jobs, jobs where I had to show up every day and stay for 12 hours a day, stand up, sitting down. I didn't had them all. Bouncers, I didn't had them all, man, right? I didn't use every excuse. I didn't use every lie. My man, I don't need you lying to me. Don't bullshit me. You ain't get the shit done. Tell me I just ain't get the shit done. Shit happens. I get it. So when people start bullshitting me and they start acting like they can get over on me, I got to call them out. So then I'm now I'm being an asshole. Because like I told you in part one of this podcast, like with relationships and all the women I was in relationships with, I, I gave you the blueprint for what I needed in order for you to be successful in a relationship with me. Yet you choosing to piss me off. Why are you doing all the things I told you I ain't like? Why are you doing that? You trying me? You testing me? You think I'm some bitch ass nigga? You think Mr. Wallace is a bitch? Pulp Fiction reference for you young niggas. It's the same thing with business. Yo, why are you lying to me, man? Why are you trying to get over on me, dog? Like, why are you doing that? I don't fuck with you. I don't bullshit you. Don't bullshit me. And so the way I do things in business sometimes, I would never, ever want my friends and family to have to experience that energy from me. Because when it comes to my money, man, I do not fuck around. Like, I do not. I have had too many things happen to me money related where I'm going to fuck around with my money. There is nothing that pisses me off more than my money being fucked with. Nothing. I haven't been in a position where somebody can fuck with Nova, right? Because she's with us all the time or with family because she's so young. So that probably will supersede the money thing. But right now, there's nothing more in the world that can piss me off than somebody trying to fuck with my money. And so if you are in business with me and you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing, you fuck with my money. And I don't want, I will cut off friends and family for that. That is a thing that I will literally cut your ass off for and I will never talk to you again. It won't feel bad about it. Because people work hard for their money, man. I know I do. I work extremely fucking hard for my money. Like y'all know I be doing these podcasts late. It's 4.32 a.m. on a Thursday. Like this, I'm doing this for the business of Group 82 and to build our brand and build my brand. Like I work hard for my fucking money. And when someone tries to take that shit or they don't respect that, yo, I, I can't fuck with you, dog. You a whole ass nigga, man. I don't, I don't, I don't trust you. And so I know I got friends and I got family members who don't view money the same way, who don't view business the same way, who don't view entrepreneurship or consumerism the same way. So I would never put them in a position where they would be a source of contention for me. Once again, like I almost got to protect them from themselves like I like our relationship I like how happy we are with each other I like the fact that you my friend or you my cousin or whatever I'm not about to put you in that position man and if you are like me in that regard you do not need to go into business with friends and family if you aren't like that where it's not that big of a deal to you if something gets fucked up with your business then maybe you should go into business with your friends and family because if it's somebody who you really trust and who you really love, even though these people will disappoint you still, like there is no one in business you can trust more than your friends and your family. More likely than not. But like I said, business is still business. Money is still money. People still do shit that you would not imagine them doing, especially as the money gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's why I literally work with people who I don't know. Like C. Rice is the only person who's involved with me in Group 82 that I know and is a friend and who I love. But his personality is like almost different from mine. It's like a great counterbalance. But like most people, man, they just can't do it. And so you have to learn to do things on your own. Like, I know I talked about that in previous episodes, but it's real. Like, y'all gonna hear me reiterate and repeat a lot of the same points on the podcast. Because this is how I truly feel. This is shit I really believe. Like, this is these are the ethos of Dorian. Like, this is my anchors. These are the shit that keeps me grounded every day. 
You know, but firmly believe you got to learn to do shit on your own, especially if you want to be an entrepreneur. And leaning on friends and family is just going to fuck you up, man, because they're going to take advantage. That's what friends and family do. That's what they do. They do. Like, I got a daughter. Nova takes advantage of me every fucking day. Every day. Today, she had a goddamn attitude all day. She's seven months all day. All day. She's teething and all that. I get it. But, like, she was mean mugging. She, we calling her name and I'm right in her face talking to her, trying to play. She looking right through me. I'm talking, like, right through me. Like, here's the camera. Like, I'm looking at the other angle right now. Like, here's the camera. Y'all, like, she's looking right there. And I'm right here in her fucking face, man. Like, right here. She looking has me like nigga fuck you get the fuck up out my face whole ass daddy like she just you know what I mean it's a demanding relationship that, I, that me and Nova have well Nova has with everybody she's seven months old but like that's how family is I wouldn't deal with that in business I'm having a conversation with you in business and you don't even want to acknowledge me you don't even want to look at me oh fuck you who the fuck you think you are you know what I mean and that's what I'm saying so there's things that you deal with as an entrepreneur that you would never deal with as a family member. I'm sorry. There's things you deal with as a family member, as a friend, that you would never deal with in your business or as an entrepreneur. You need to be cognizant of that because those lines can get blurred like we talked about before about the growth of friendships, right, from when you're young to you're older. When you decide to go into business with your friends, whether it's a podcast, whether it's a restaurant, t-shirt company, they manage you as an artist, they help you start a digital marketing agency, they're filming videos for you as a fitness instructor, what, whatever it is, a realtor, real estate license, y'all getting them together, or they coming to work for you. When, you. when you start that, when you take the friendship or, or family ship to that level, I mean, man, you open up a whole new can of worms. And there's a lot of things that can really, really rock that relationship. Is your relationship that strong with that person? Where they can fuck with your money? Where they can fuck with your business? Is your relationship that strong with that person where if they caused you to lose everything you worked for, you would be okay with it? I don't think anybody is in a position to say that. I know I'm not. I know I'm not. So that's why, like, I don't go into business with family and friends. And even further, like, most people aren't trained on business. So they don't understand business. They don't understand consumerism. They don't understand consumer behavior. They don't understand marketing. They don't understand branding and the psychology of colors and and comparative pricing and all they don't understand and on top of that motherfuckers don't want to read man they don't want to read they don't want to read there is nothing more in this world that pisses me off than somebody that asks the same fucking questions but they don't just want to google that shit everything i learned about group 82 everything i learned about the music business everything i learned about marketing everything i learned about advertising i learned googling everything man like, I'm recording this podcast right now. I told y'all, I ain't know nothing about these mics and shit. I ain't know what an interface was, nigga. I ain't know what Logic Pro was. I ain't know how to set up this camera, nigga. I ain't know how to do the lights. And I ain't know how to do all this shit. I read and figured that shit out through trial and error. And most people don't want to read. Do your family members like reading? Do your friends like reading? Or are they sitting around watching Tyler Perry movies and shit? They sitting around... Arguing about what's the next thing on Netflix. All them niggas do is talk about sports. Or all they do is watch reality TV and HGTV and cooking shows and shit. Like, are they out here really learning and trying to expand their mind and try to get more money? Are they waiting for somebody to hand them that knowledge too? You can't go into business with people who just waiting on folks to hand them shit. You can't do that. You can't do it. Can't do it. Won't do it. It's going to fuck you up. You're going to be mad all the time. All the time. You're an entrepreneur. You're a lifetime student. You're a lifelong student. Like, I'm a person that I didn't like school. I take that back. I liked school from kindergarten to about seventh grade. Seventh grade is when it started to suck. 
which is ironically the time that like girls start growing big titties and shit, which that was actually cool. But, but like school sucked to me. And so I hated it from seventh grade on. I hated it. I got a master's degree. That's a lot of years of hating school, man. I mean, shit, seven to 12 was five. When I was an undergrad, five and a half, ten and a half, and two. I mean, you talking 12 more years, 12 years of my life. I hated every day. Not like in a depressive way, which I spoke about before, but like just, I just hated it. I hated fucking going to school. I hated that shit. I fucking hated school, man. But school, school didn't teach us how to think on our own. It didn't, it doesn't foster independent thought. It doesn't foster creativity, even though you take art and you take music. And, and in the industrial arts class, they want us to be creative. And they have these pottery classes and all that shit. But they don't really, really want us to use that in our profession. They don't want us to do that. I mean, think about that. We take art, nigga. I took an art class from kindergarten all the way up to sophomore year in high school because I had to. That's 11 years of art class. And if I would have told them people at school, I want to be a professional artist, they would have laughed in my fucking face. Now, why the fuck have we been taking art for 11 years? School's some bullshit. The American school system is just absolutely fucked. It brainwashes us for 13 years. K-12, K through 12, 13 years, they brainwash us. And they don't teach us any of the things we need. Especially when it comes to business. So, if they haven't been taught in their formal education, and they don't go and do the research, how in the hell do you think you're going to be able to go into business with this person? Or I even say it to you. If you didn't get taught in school, even if you majored in business and college entrepreneurship, that don't mean shit. And you aren't out here reading and putting the work. How the hell you think you're going to start your own business? You're not going to. Or you can start your business. You're going to be an ass clown. Not going to make no money. Maybe you might make money. It's not going to last. I mean, I'm constantly learning. Like, I'm learning my KPIs now. Like, there's numbers in my business that I don't know that I need to know. Right? There's things I'm learning all the time, every single day. Constantly consuming new information. Because especially with today, with social media and internet, trends change so fast. And we can quantify it. And we can see them coming. We have the data. and We have that personal feel. Right? We can, we know when things are about to die off or things are about to pop off. Like right now with streaming wars, like motherfuckers just sitting around. <laughs> All those you sitting around about. Like it's movie theaters. Y'all about to be out of business. And cable, like channels that are only on cable television, y'all about to be out of business. Like CNBC. Like CNBC, I guess they're a part of NBC Universal. So I guess they might have a part of the streaming on, um, on, on when NBC drops their streaming service. But Y'all about to be fucked too, right? Like there's specific like Bravo and E. Like what's going to happen when, when, when the streaming wars, when this shit actually settles down, right? When Disney Plus and Hulu and Netflix and Fox is probably going to drop one. And when all these motherfuckers, when it finally settles down, what's going to happen to you, E? What's going to happen to you, Bravo? What's going to happen to you, A&E? What's going to happen to you, HGTV? What's going to happen to you, Food Network? Why ain't y'all developing content now that it's going to make for that easy transition? Going back to what I was saying, we can see trends coming. And since we can see trends coming, you can't put yourself around people that don't want to go look at that shit. It's going to fuck up your business. It's going to fuck up your life. This entire episode has been about being mentally healthy. That's, that's what this episode's about. It's about being mentally healthy in so many capacities. And business is something that will really rock your mental health. Like, if you aren't a person that is well-grounded, and like I talked about before with the insecurities, like, I got mine, but they don't stop me from doing shit. I'm going to do what the fuck I want to do. You don't like it, stuff my... My mom listens to the podcast. I'm trying to clean the language up a little bit. Thanks, mommy. But, like, I'm I'm not... You can't let your insecurities get in the way 
and you can't deal with people whose insecurities are going to get in your way. And in business, your insecurities get revealed real quick. Real fucking quick, boy. We should probably put like a Jordan 100 drop in there. I probably will do that. Let me pause. Real fucking quick, nigga. Yeah, that's going to be the spot I put in. Hope it worked. Um, But, like, you have to know yourself. If you don't know yourself, you have to know your strengths, you got to know your weaknesses. A lot of people don't. A lot of people don't know their strengths. A lot of people don't know their weaknesses. A lot of people don't want to know their strengths or weaknesses. And they will use excuses. And in business, that shit just doesn't work. It just doesn't work. Ask Blockbuster, did that shit work? <laughs> I mean, ask Sears, did that work? Ask GameStop right now, that worked. Ask Macy's, that worked. I love talking about these businesses that have went under. I actually went in on this dude on Twitter because he said he loves seeing major college basketball coaches crash and burn at big programs. And me, obviously, being a former Division One college basketball coach, I can't stand that shit. Obviously, everybody gets in situations where they're probably going to get fired, but I don't think about the head coach. Like, Texas basketball right now. Like, Shaka, who I used to work for, Shaka's, Shaka's going to get fired this year. And it ain't so much about Shaka. Like, Shaka got his contract. His buyout's going to be $10 million. He's, he's going to be fine. His assistant's going to be fine, too. This University of Texas, they're all probably making 250000 plus. But the ops guy, the video coordinator, the graduate assistants, the strength and conditioning coach, all those people, like, they're, they're the ones that's going to have to scramble. They're the ones that's got to move their families. They're the ones that's going to restart all this shit and do all these things over and over again. You know what I mean? That, those are the people who they have to deal with. And so, it, um, I feel bad for them. So I hate when coaches get fired, even though I know it's part of the business, because I think about the, the other people up under them. Now, when it comes to major corporations, it's a little bit different, right? Even though when like a Macy's goes down or a Sears or a Blockbuster, there are a lot of people who are just working the retail, the customer service, the people who we deal with every time we go into these stores, they're out of a job. But at the same time, man, like, if you work a cashier at Macy's or you work a cashier at Blockbuster or Sears, you can go get a job at, at Target or, or Best Buy or I can't even, I was about to say Electronic Boutique and Sam Goody, all them out of business too. But like, you can go get a cashier job somewhere else, you know what I mean? But like, when you look at these huge corporations and the lack of just guts and how pussified they are, they just sit and just wait. And they don't do nothing. And they just wait to get slaughtered. It is embarrassing. It is embarrassing. Like, I mean, I even look at McDonald's right now. Like, McDonald's is doing exceptional. And I think they will for a while. But there's going to come to a point, man, where, like, Burger King's on it, but a, a, a McDonald's is not. The Impossible Burger is fucking fire. Okay? That is a fire food. Like, it's not like... It's gross. That shit tastes good. And so, if I'm McDonald's, why have I introduced that yet? Burger King's doing it. I'm Wendy's. Why am I had that yet? If I'm Five Guys, if I'm Steak and Shake, why don't, why don't y'all have that yet? What are y'all doing? Like, this vegan, this vegetarian shit, it's not, a, it's not a trend, man. Beyond Meat stock is doing insane. You think I'm joking? Go look that shit up. It's been out, I think, maybe 15 months. Their stock is doing crazy. Crazy growth. Like, this shit's not going nowhere. So if you want these restaurants, what are you waiting on? What are you waiting on? I tell people this, like, I've said to John on earlier episodes, and I tell people this one-on-one. We give these corporations too much credit. We give these businesses too much credit. We think that these people are geniuses. Same with college, right? We give college too much credit. We think if something's in a college textbook or if a professor tells us that, that is more, it has more value than if you go find it on fucking YouTube. Most of your college professors are finding shit off of YouTube and just repeating the shit. J-Rock, my barber, he said that today. He said, because he learned a lot of shit off of YouTube. He said that uh, a motherfucker can, a, a dumb nigga can sound smart from some shit he learned on YouTube. I said, that's true. That's absolutely true. Because he might be repeating and the shit he's repeating is right. 
I know there's stuff I've said on Instagram and on YouTube and on Facebook, Dorian Group 82 on all platforms that y'all have repeated to other people that y'all ain't fully understand the concept, but because you repeated it and the shit is rooted in facts, because y'all know I don't be talking no bullshit on here, you sounded smart in a motherfucker. I mean, shit, I told some of y'all might have got you some pussy or something. Might have got you a job. Might have made you some cake. And you have no idea what the fuck it means. Any of the shit I said. The facts are there. It's now it's about the execution. It's about the application. Are you executing? Are you applying? Or are you just out here talking? That's where that land of cap comes in now. That's why social media is so popular. It's the land of cap, right? You can do all these things that makes it seem like you know what the fuck you're doing, know what the fuck you're saying, right? And people will, will buy into that. They'll feed into that shit. And you ain't doing nothing. You ain't applying, right? Y'all looking at all this shit like I'm doing podcasts. I'm posting videos. I'm, you know what I mean? I've got a business running. I could be, I could be g all you niggas. Y'all wouldn't even know. Y'all wouldn't even know. It's the land that we live in now. It's the world we live in now. It's the land of social media. That gap is there, right? Because all the information is everywhere now. It, it used to be somebody could cap if they went to college. Because if you know they went to college, they had access to information that you didn't have access to. So even if they are capping, right, and acting like they're smarter than they truly are, the fact they actually went to school you know they had access to things that you didn't. It's not like that anymore. It's not like that. We got er we got access to everything that the kids at Harbor got access to. How fucking crazy is that? Think my grandmother, Lavinia Clark, rest in peace. Think if I could tell my grandma when she was 20 that now you have access to everything that those rich white kids at Harvard University have access to. What would have happened to my family? Would I even be here? She might have met a, a better nigga than the sperm donor that my dad had. I, I probably wouldn't be here. So thank God she did smash that whole ass nigga, but that's where we are now. You got a Harvard education in your pocket. You got a Harvard education in your pocket. And you sitting around arguing about Netflix movies. I don't understand y'all. I don't understand y'all. I don't understand what it's about. If you want money, man, the opportunity is there. If you want financial freedom, the opportunity is there. This ain't me getting on some Tony Robbins, give me your money type shit. This is me just keeping it 100 with you. Like, you need to do this shit yourself. There ain't nothing that I can do for you. Well, actually, there is things we can do for you, group82music.com, but, like, there ain't, you still, we give you the tools, man. We ain't about to be doing shit for you. We give you the tools. We'll build the website, make the cover, or build a logo, we'll get you a Wikipedia page. I'll talk to you about your digital brand analysis and break everything down and give you the steps. Spotify placement, social media ads, we'll do all that. We'll do all that. But you still got to have a quality product and you still got to have the work ethic. I will tell you exactly how to hire interns and find good ones who will bust their ass for you and how you can help them get jobs in the, in the future. But you still got to know what the fuck you're doing. The amount of people that hit me up every day for advice and they still in the same place they were a fucking year ago, two years ago now I'm seeing on Instagram. It's fucking insane. It's insane. Y'all don't want this shit. You niggas want to talk about it. Y'all want to be in a land of cap. You want to fulfill your insecurities and live out your selfishness through social media. You want to fill those voids. voids. You want to put band-aids on that. On your insecurities and your selfishness on social, through social media. Makes you feel good. When well, you're not doing jack shit. If anything I said resonated with you in this episode, make the change, man. Stop fucking around. If you're not going to make the change, stop fucking DMing me. <laughs> I'm sick of that shit, man.
to cuss some nigga out this week asking me for a hundred dollars. Bitch, I don't know you, begging ass nigga. All this shit on my IG, nigga. You come to my shit begging? Nigga, you a bitch. That's why you gonna stay broke. But if you really want this shit, man, you really, really want this shit. Come along for the ride. Stay here at 82 Points of View. Follow me on all social media platforms at Dorian Group 82. Visit our website, group82music.com. Download our free ebook, How to Get One Million Streams on Spotify. And keep fucking with me, because I'm going to be here. I'm going to keep rocking with y'all. I love y'all. I'm out the pond. Y'all stay true. Group82music.com.